Today, One More Night won't have one guest, but two, and they are located at the Antipode. Their background and personal story is quite different, even if they are very good friends. They are both partners in one of the most famous architectural companies, founded in 1980 in UK, with more than 650 staff over the world today. The company work is characterized by a very strong conceptual and innovation approach. They are known for their human and sustainable design. Tonight, you will meet Andrew Cortez from Sydney and Kate Bruce from London, both from Grim Show. You have a wine, I have a beer, should be fine. I have a coffee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have a glass of wine, so you see me, which I've always tried now, so um, <laughs> maybe I should just go and fill up and then I'm fine. Yeah, you can, you can get yeah let, let's fill, let, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm doing the same. Uh, I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. Good evening, good morning. Uh, I have the opportunity to say it twice in the same sentence. Um, so today we are really uh, pleased and glad to have uh, not one, but two speakers, two designers uh, with uh, two really different uh, locations. Do you mind both of you to, uh, to describe your environment, where you are living, uh, the lifestyle you, you have there, and uh, how you think the place where you live influence your daily uh, work and your daily design? We're not living in usual times. We're living in the, you know, very much with the, our relationship to the global pandemic. Um, mm. I'm uh, sort of, I feel trapped in a way that I'm, you know, I'm in the UK and I have been, uh, living back in the UK probably for nine or ten years now. Um, but I've always thought that in many ways the UK uh, was, a, was sort of a, an island nation that meant that you can spring from it almost to anywhere. Um, I'm very used to um, being on the move uh, and I have enjoyed, I suppose, living in different parts of the world, um, you know, over my working period. Um, I, uh, our, our office in the UK is in, in London. Um, I actually, having returned from Australia, chose instead of living in London to live in Bristol. Um, so I live about 100 miles west of uh, London and that's where I'm uh, currently you know, speaking to you from. So. About the city of Bristol and, and London, I mean, uh, how you feel? I understand that you have this international uh, background, experience of living in different places. Uh, how you think the city influenced your, uh, your curiosity, maybe your, uh, your uh, design mood uh, every day? I think, you know, London is a, has established itself over hundreds of years, I think almost as a, a place of trade as a almost a transactional place. Um, people come through it and come to it to um, I, I think relate to one another to um, almost to kind of understand different backgrounds and to coexist um, within this kind of great framework uh, of a city. That I think is quite different to the regional cities of the UK which are more um, static, I think, in many ways. They have to, I think, mature to understand better their relationship uh, back to London, which has become very dominant, I would say, within the context of the UK. Um, but I suppose what the smaller cities give you is this feeling of uh, a region, of kind of being part of, not just being part of the city, but being part of the city and the region around it. So there's a there's sort of a, a local attitude, I suppose, a localism that goes with the smaller cities of the UK that I don't think you experience in London. I think London in, in many ways is, is, an, is an urbanity and it's actually quite separated um, from um, uh, the kind of rural hinterland around it. Um, in many ways, the, the, the areas around London are there as satellites and commuter belt, um, you know, 
to, for people to travel in and out of this huge kind of you know this this great capital city. So I I, I quite like the duality. I quite like the idea that there is the place that I've chosen to live at the moment is um, you know is you know, does have this urban versus rural. Um, exchange, I think, which I I enjoy, I enjoy, and I know that goes right back to um, uh, you know almost the kind of start of my life, how I grew up, if you like. What about you, Andrew, uh, in uh, in your studio? Uh, how how's the city? Uh, how you feel the city influence your uh, your life, your uh, your studio uh, atmosphere and creativity? My I'm, I'm a Sydney cider of, of um, and my family has had lived here for as long as Sydney has been uh, settled from um, European settlement. Um, and I was just reflecting, I, when I left school, I, we all, Australia is also uh, an island nation, um, just a little bit bigger than the UK, <laughs> um, but about one third of the population. Um, and uh, so that kind of puts an interesting dynamic um, and still has, um, it was established obviously um, um, in, in terms of its European um, trajectory um, for only, um, basically it, it arose as, a, as obviously from, from the relationship with, with, with England but then really emerged um, into a nation around the, the, the gold rush of the 1860s. And, and then that trajectory kind of, um, kind of began to change quite significantly um, in the 60s through to the 1980s. I, I finished school just over a decade after the um, Sydney Opera House was um, opened. Um, so I had written the Sydney go from a very... <coughs> parochial, not par that's the wrong word, but a very kind of um, isolated mindset. I haven't realized that effectively both of you are Islander <laughs> and yeah. Uh, effectively, yeah, with a mix, uh, mixed culture, mixed people uh, and, and this uh, exchange. My, my next question is really, um, I know as a company, you are working as, a, as one studio, one global studio, you are uh, exchanging and you have this um, network studio model. So I would like to understand how you both are, or you, you, you two studio are working together or maybe with other studio as well. Well, I joined the practice in 1995. It, it, it kind of had this idea that in order to um, work into projects that you sort of had to subscribe to the place um, that the project was in mm. to understand mm. how the project um, needed to nestle within the context of the city and and ultimately be consumed by it if you like and th that allowed us um, to start to think about um, well should we actually uh, you know start to put down more permanent bases in um, Australia and should we start to put down a permanent base in in uh, in the USA in the United States and I think that kind of um, commitment to a place when you practice is really, really important than just that exploitation of place. Um, and, I, and when I talk about place, we're talking about communities, cultures, and understanding of, of the broad history, the landscape, the, the attitude towards regeneration and reconciliation. Yeah. Mm. You have to live within those communities to actually, I believe, um, propose or, or authentic or meaningful um, contributions. So I think what Grimshaw set up was, was a very respectful practice to do that. And that the fact that we don't have a kind of uh, an arrogance that comes with the way that the, the practice interacts in the projects that it undertakes. And often, I think one of the great um, stories that I used to love is that idea of exploring, take, being an adventure and going out and kind of putting yourself in circumstances where you're not quite well founded um, or known or respected and kind of working it out from, from there. And I think that's part of that kind of community of partnership that we have that we're all somewhat motivated by those adventures. 
and, and held us together back then and continues to hold us together was sort of the fellowship. It's almost the, the relationship uh, of uh, the individuals of Grimshaw that have, um, I think, great mutual respect for each other um, and, and, and have friendship, actually. I think that there is this sort of, there, there is this bond. I think it's really interesting for us to understand your background, where you come from. Um, I'm talking here about the hometown. I think it's also important uh, to know uh, where you you grow up and um, you know the, your your first uh, let's say living experience. But also, of course, uh, the school where you have been and the different place that you have been uh, living and how this this place influence uh, your uh, your mindset, maybe your uh, your. Um, your design approach. I grew up in a in a very small village in Northumberland, in the mm -hmm. very north of England, on the on the border of Scotland. Um, you know, about fifteen miles west of Newcastle. Um, obviously, Newcastle was the the major city um, close to me. There, I spent a lot of my um, time, particularly you know as a teenager and a bit later. I then I went then went to university in Sheffield, but. Um, and, and again, the, the course there was a lot to do with, I think, um, sort of urbanism as much as, as it was to do with architecture. Um, London was always this, you know, you grew up in the north, London was always this kind of exotic city that was quite a, quite a long way away. And I, I remember going mm -hmm. to London and sort of feeling, I've got to say, a bit disappointed. I think London was a bit, you know, on its knees in the late 70s um, when I when I first started to kind of travel down to it and I, I always felt that you know everything else was further than London so I remember kind of saying to my parents one day you know I was going to accompany a friend who was going off to Paris to university and I just jumped up on the train with his friend I was probably 16 or something and just grabbed my passport and headed off to Europe and and since then, I've, mm. you know, and I found that very easy and very normal. And and to actually feel like a stranger in someone else's city, um, I found a great I found great comfort in it, Michael. To be honest, and I I, I actually think there is mm. something quite wonderful about going and living in other places and and sort of seeing things from a very very different set of values and and kind of trying to work out, you know, do those values. And the way that um, you know structures and communities are organised teach you something that is actually fundamental. Um, and and you know and how do you how do you translate that into into? So I you know I, I you know I came. I think I've got this great stability um, from my upbringing, which was extraordinarily stable. You know, in those first eighteen years. But since then, I've been a traveller. I, I actually really mm. enjoy moving and being almost elsewhere. It's like wherever I am, I want to be somewhere else. <laughs> and <laughs> and, and I, I kind of, I like that. I, I kind of, I find solace and comfort actually in that. And so I feel very trapped, I suppose, at the moment. With Thank you. Andrew, what about you? I am um, obviously sort of a sit side of it. My upbringing was in a location which is about 45 kilometers from the center of the city. Mm. on a sandstone ridge in the bush overlooking one of the tributaries of the Hawkesby River. Um, so it was immense isolation um, and where you're, you lived in a very, I wouldn't even call it suburban, but almost like a suburban uh, town of about maybe 600 to 1,200 residents. Um, and it was always about building something from where something never existed. Um, so kind of, it was also a place of massive imagination um, because your front yard and your backyard or your whatever was the bush and you were surrounded mm. by wildlife. It was very visceral, it was ar aromatic, it was very physical. Um, and so it was, you know, it was, a, it was a t and you just used to build all the time, whether you're building dams, caves, Tunnels, tree houses, you had, you was just, you were in this constant kind of interaction. My father, when the, they were building the first church um, in, in the suburb, which was, um, I was brought up in, and it was built by everyone. Um, it was built from trachyte stones, 
that were the ballast of a ship, the ships which had no longer required them from the UK. Um, and so they bought those, those trachyte stones and built um, these, um, the first school, primary mm -hmm. school, and the first church hall, which was a community hall, like a church doubled up as both. And it was built by the community. And you used to go, you know, you used to participate in that community building something. When you you are designing in Shenzhen, uh, what kind of trim, what kind of uh, ID you are bringing here um, in your design? What is the, the big vision you have for Shenzhen through your design? I, as I as I lived, you know, I lived in Hong Kong before um, mm. 1997. You know, I'd left um, before that. So um, you know, and the and the so the. You know the border condition was was really very different. Um, uh, the it, it felt very much you know as you went through Shenzhen, it was very much a kind of a you know it was a place that was was the border town. You went through it to go somewhere else. Um, you didn't go to it. Is it? I mean it, it 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 wasn't there, and then suddenly it's there. It's it's, it's kind of it's it, I mean it's quite phenomenal, isn't it? I mean it's a true international phenomena um, I mm. think. and I suppose mm. what Shenzhen is now doing is it's it's representing what it wants to be and it because it's standing shoulder to shoulder with Hong Kong and standing you know not so far from Guangzhou in order for it to be influential it needs to be of scale and it, and it needs to have purpose and it's finding that scale and purpose at, a, at an extraordinary um, kind of speed and felt like there was Um, a very real opportunity for Shenzhen uh, to have a, a far uh, sort of deeper relationship to, um, you know, the natural form, the, or what actually is the city within the context of nature. Um, and mm -hmm. and, and I, I think, you know, I, for me, that was the perspective that I sought to try and Um, reveal yeah. and, and kind of accentuate it, it, it could and should sort of lead the way in terms of set because of part to do with the kind of the the, the sort of deeper relationship to um, private sector and land ownership um, but also mm. to do with the, the, the notion that you know the very time that Shenzhen is constructing itself um, the private car and the dominance of uh, you know carbon-based fuel, you know, both in terms of vans, lorries, um, and private cars as, as the kind of means of moving around the city and distributing things, you know, has to be diminished. Um, and if you, if, you, if you actually say, well, let's diminish that as the starting point and deal with mobility in a, in a fundamentally different way, which is part to do with mass transit and, and, you know, the public transit systems, but also part to do with You know the emergence of um, personal, uh, you know, more autonomous, more electric, cleaner transit forms. Um, you know, the there is an opportunity there for Shenzhen to, to kind of show the way in that. Um. Shenzhen is building so many projects. Is that um, and with this great ambition to be a, a city of innovation and imagination that should absolutely sponsor. A number of those projects, which are not necessarily the kind of the iconic cultural projects or the large transport projects, but are more where the day-to-day -day lives of the the city is made. So the places of production, the places of work, and the interaction between work, production, and, and life, yeah. Um, yeah. and how it intersects with with the environment. I think we find that is where the the real kind of resonance that, that Shenzhen could have in terms of leading innovation um, and that, that, that more speculative um, development is where the, where, the, where the real challenge is to make Shenzhen achieve that, that ambition and that's where we believe that we perhaps can, can contribute to, to really true innovation. Thank you for this very rich answer of, uh, of this complex question. Uh, I know it's, uh, it's not easy. Um, I see the time also running and I think we are arriving at the end of this, uh, of this conversation. Um, maybe we can just finish with one simple question. It's um, yeah, what is your, uh, 
your dream for Shenzhen? I mean, your, your vision in future of uh, 10 years later, what Shenzhen could be? Um, we always say, you know, Shenzhen, it's a prototype definitively for China and maybe for the world. So uh, how you, you see Shenzhen 10 years or maybe 20 years later? I think, Michael, your use of the word prototype is, is phenomenally accurate. It's, it's, it's absolutely, <laughs> um, if, you, if you were looking forward um, 10 years, I think in many ways it's the, you know, being in witness and watching the resolution of the network between these different cities forming, um, rather than thinking about Shenzhen in isolation. So, sure. you know, I know it, it is the sort of, you know, the Macau to Hong Kong, the Hong Kong to Shenzhen, the Shenzhen to Guangzhou, et cetera. You know, it's the, it's this, mm. it's how, how does, the how, does a, how does a place, you know, um, stop worrying too much about what it is in, in isolation and start to mm. com, com, contemplate much more how it exists in, in, you know, in a complementary sort of way to the the huge places that exist around it and and what does mm. that feel like and i think the fusion between shenzhen and Hong Kong is the thing that is almost the most fascinating because of their history yeah, yeah. You know, it's, i think how that plays out will be uh extraordinary and that and that will play out in the next 10 years no question so. um, i think that I, the idea of prototype obviously is, is understood but the other thing that we're talking about is reciprocity um you know, what, what Shenzhen is, is, is doing is very much totemic of where China is and where it's how Shenzhen kind of acts in terms of its values to its local communities, uh, its relationship to the other domestic city, but then it's kind of uh, international relationships as well, that, that place of exchange, mm. embrace exchange and incorporation and um, and. Um, can it become a truly international city within within China? Um, and by international, I mean it is constituted by many people interacting with it and contributing to it. Yeah. So thank you very much. I think it was really a, a great moment, uh, and it was really an insightful conversation, and it means a lot for us. I mean, just well, to, to turn the question, if you've got a minute, because I'm really fascinated. Is there, is there, are there, do you feel that there are there is a community or that there are citizens. Yeah, 10, ten, ten years ago, when, when I've been asking through WebTide different events and uh, activities, you know, where you belong, where, where is your home, you know? And I had <laughs> all the city in China and the world, you know? But when we asked now, uh, now in 2020, you know, people would say, I'm Shenzhen. And I'm very fascinated by that. It's how, you know, um, we become citizen. Understanding Shenzhen, it's understanding its population because it's quite a lot a top-down situation here. But at the end of the day, the, the population will define the city, you know, mm -hmm. and um, and it's happening slowly. Yeah, it's a really interesting thing that we we learnt doing these projects um, because there is so much work going on um, across the city, and not only the city and the other. Um, cities in the Bay, uh, was to be very careful about being, having uh, Simukra or repli repli be a replicant. Um, because if you build yeah. that quickly, there's so many similar ideas and themes um, which are being explored. And, you know, it becomes, you know, as I said, a citizen is a customer or a consumer as opposed to yeah. a real yeah, exactly. participant in the city. Um, and the architecture doesn't find itself of, of any great legacy, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's been replicated um, because it's not unique to circumstance mm -hmm. in place. I think it's a real danger with, with Shenzhen with this idea of, of speed and process. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, uh, for me, it's still a big question mark, this city, and uh, especially the identity. Again, it's um, uh, what will what will be this city in 10 or 20 years? Um, maybe other cities have more establishment, more, uh, you know, uh, people who know or people who have. Uh, but here, it's all people, the only thing they own, it's a dream. 
and you know an ambition and it's it's why i'm i'm, I'm so excited to live here to um to, yeah to be in this in this big wave in this big movement but don't know how the wave will land on the sand you know <laughs> it's a very very appreciated interview Thank you for your time again. I, I know it's very early and very late, and uh, but it was really, truly a, a pleasure. It was lovely to meet you, Michael. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.